I could never be a yoga teacher. Not because only do I not have that yoga teacher body, but I don't have the demeanor of a yoga teacher. You take yoga, so you know from this. Yoga teachers are very calm and very zen and have an ability to be very peaceful while bending in various positions, and I just could not be that. So there's a branch of Judaism called Musar, which is very calm as well. And I've come to realize that teachers of Musar are like yoga teachers without the flexibility. <laughs> I have avoided taking Musar because I am not such a calm person. And finally, there was a course offered, Musar for teens, and I was like, this I could do. <laughs> I can enter into this. And into the third of the four classes in the series, I realized that the teachers of the Musar class were exactly like the yoga teachers, so calm. And they were exhibiting everything that would be hoped for in a Musar teacher. What is Musar? It's the study of what are called midot, or principles, or measures. They are a deep, deep reflection inspired by Rabbi Israel Salanter on the ways that we should be in the world, the attributes, the midot we should have, like patience or silence or pleasantness or justice or thriftiness or diligence or peace of mind or respect or humility, all these things. And teachers of Musar learn to be very much in touch with those aspects in themselves and to bring them out in others. And then the third of four classes, I said, I don't think I can teach Musar because as I thought, you are the calmest teachers I have ever had. And I can't do that. And they said, you can, it takes time. You just have to reflect and learn on Musar. And I realized at that moment, the teacher and the topic were one. That they were embodying everything about they were teaching and the way they were acting. And in what we read tonight, we have the very same thing going on. What the text is saying and where it is coming from teaches us everything. This, and I'll hold it up for those watching at home, is what is known, it's literally called a bandolin. I call it a banjo Torah, but it's a bandolin. On one side, it looks like a regular banjo or a bandolin, and on the other side, there's a bit of Torah. And so this banjo Torah teaches us a lot of things. It teaches us of the foresight that Rabbi Singer or Rabbi Emeritus had, that when it came through touring in an exhibit of Holocaust artifacts, he said, let us put it in the ark and let it be read like Torah is read. But here's the thing that it teaches even more. The text that's going on in the Banjo Torah is horrid. Jacob has just learned that one of his sons has slept with one of his four wives. He's lost his other wife, Rachel. We're about to get the lineage of Esau, his brother, who ultimately, as Rabbi Dan shared, becomes a nemesis in Jewish history. There is so much that is bad here. And whoever, whatever Nazi or whoever person used to fix this Torah with Torah, which no one who respected Torah would ever do, the person who used this Torah to fix this banjo picked the, such an evil, dark part of the Torah, as if we're cut off from everything else, as if we think Jacob couldn't go forward. And in another way, it teaches us a lesson. One of the things that Musar teachers are supposed to have is incredible sensitivity. They are supposed to be so in touch with themselves that they can feel every emotion that runs through them and exhibit it and see it in the world. Very, very in touch with themselves. The rest of us, like me, may be numb from sometimes to all these nuances that these Musa teachers are not. And so every week we read the Torah that has the whole Torah. Maybe once a week, once a year, on the portion that the Banjo Torah lies, we read just from a circle and we are reminded of all the scroll that was gone, all the scroll that was cut or burned or buried or discarded or thrown away. And then all of a sudden you realize it's not just about the scroll that's missing, it's about the people that are missing. And so all of a sudden this Banjo Torah comes alive with so many lessons. It is this portion of Vayishlach that we read from it, from it and we are blessed that we are able to read from it. But at the same time, we take great note 
that those who did not survive the Holocaust are like the scroll that is gone. They're no longer with us, but very much still remembered. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.